Good morning and welcome again to the first International Faust Conference. Um, hope you all sleep well. Uh, so we'll begin uh, the session with Benedict Gaster from Bristol. Yeah. Thank you. Um, and we're going to talk about outside the block syndicate. So oh, I'll leave it. Uh, welcome. Uh, okay. So um, anyway, so it turns out that John Hughes, who's a professor at Chalmers University and is a uh, a very famous functional programmer. He um, developed this thing called Arrows, in the, it, but he developed it originally in the context of Haskell, and I'll talk a little bit about what they are in a minute. But it, some other people realized that actually they're much more general than Haskell, and it doesn't have to be applied to Haskell. They're actually, it turns out, they're monoids in a particular category. And um, But in the context of this talk, it turns out that what's very interesting about them, if you take a particular instance of them, particularly a DSP instance, and I'll talk about what this means, then you can show, as I do in the paper, that they are, um, that you can encode blocks, uh, the algebra of blocks into arrows, uh, well, a particular instance of arrows. And I don't, don't do it in the paper and everything, but I've actually done now the, the reverse translation, so you can show that it's the complete translation goes one for the other. And why might you care about that? Well, actually, I'm not sure you would necessarily, but you might. But the reason we care about it, the reason that we're interested in it at Bristol, is because my two collaborators that I'm working with, Nathan, at, Nathan's my PhD student, and Tom is a professor in um, audio tech at the university. We are interested in developing, kind of at the end of this spectrum, kind of new musical instruments. You know, instruments that are based around digital technology, but will have new interfaces as well. Won't necessarily just be a keyboard in this context and stuff and things. But we're also very interested in building um, these on very cheap components, so that we can use, um, you know, rather than being, you know, 500 or perfect, you know, thousands of pounds or dollars or whatever uh, instruments that you can play with. That musicians could build, take this technology and build it, you know, for you know less than 100 euros maybe potentially to get going. I mean, obviously there's still things they'd want to do. And so with that in mind, I'm going to skip these a little bit because I haven't got that much time. We've been developing this new board. There's actually two boards. They're not, this is an old version of it, Revision, which um, the big chip in there is an ARM microprocessor with, for doing DSP. But it's a standard you know, single core processor running at 400 megahertz, and it has DSP extensions for doing that. And it's a completely bare machine over here. And this one over here is the control processor, you know, in the, in the kind of this is running it. Uh, sample rate, this is running at control rate, and the idea they're communicating via some bus. And what we want to look at, what we're studying, and Nathan in particular, is looking at new ways of high-level languages, or DSLs, you know, as you might think about, for expressing musical scores, like looking at temperament, but also, obviously, we want to generate DSP that runs on these machine chips. And so I've got to be completely frank with you, we started out writing this, and um, didn't have much experience in the audio domain, and so I've started writing a DSP programming language based on arrows because it, it was a clear fit. But halfway through that I discovered Faust and you know completely I've come to it. And then I discovered a quick later actually Faust's really cool, but also realized that actually there was an obvious relationship between the block and the arrows. And I don't claim to be the first. I, if you look on the Wikipedia page for Faust, there's um, a description, an informal description of arrows and uh, Faust being related and how you can encode one and the other. And uh, all the paper does is really formalize that a bit more and it allows us now to take our little DSL that we've built, compile it down via LLVM, just as you guys do, to, to run on the ARM processor here, but use the ARM runtime. I mean, sorry, use the Faust runtime. So we, haven't, we can use all your libraries that you were talking about yesterday, but still use our little language. And you know, it's just partly a historical thing. We may just end up using Faust, to be honest. But, ah, but one of the reasons we might not, and it's not a criticism of Faust at all, is because what we want to build is this kind of little puzzle showing where they all fit together. So we'll have a, a, a little DSL building up um, a score, for example, and that would connect to certain uh, parts of the DSP language to do that. And we're building the framework in Rust at the bottom down here. And the idea is that we want to be able to show, build a commutative diagram, for example, to show that they're all sound, it's type safe and go round. So it, it's a, it is an academic project in the sense of what we're trying to build. And we may plug in Faust, because particularly now that we have a translation, and we may not, but that's not a criticism of Faust, it's just where we might go, you know, I, I'm, and I'm not sure. To be honest, I've got to be truthful, the more I use Faust, the more likely that we'll be interested to plug in that in, rather than just doing something else, because we probably won't do it as well, and we haven't got as many people working on it, so. But anyway, I just wanted to give you a little history of where we came from. So, arrows. Arrows, 
some people have mentioned monads, but the main thing about, about arrows, arrows are just a way of thinking about abstractly, algebraically, computations. You know, you want to represent a computation, and in particular, we want to write a conversation that might have some inputs A, working on some input values A, and have some output values, uh, sorry, B, and some output values C. And it turns out that what John Hughes noticed in 2000 was that actually there's loads of abstractions, so parsing was the one that he started on in particular, that fit this really well, okay, fit this abstraction really well. And you can think of arrow generally just as a function arrow. I mean, it's not, but for all intents and purposes, particularly when you're thinking about DSP, you can think of it just as a function arrow. And um, what's really nice about it is that just in the way that blocks does it, uh, the block algebra, so when I say blocks, is that once you abstract that and provide that as an abstract data type, then you can't construct programs that don't work in the particular domain. You know, you can't construct programs that start to break the fact that you want to sample at a certain point. You, can, you know, you can't do double sampling and things like that without explicitly adding it to your language. And so it adds a nice constraint and you end up with just these combinators or algebraic operations that allow you to build up interesting computations in that domain, just as you do with the comma or the colon operators in Faust. You know, there aren't just arbitrary ones. You have to build them up from that. And that allows you then to build a DSP pipeline or whatever the pipeline is, and then you can optimize it in the way that you want. Um, so I'll just go through some of these operations. I'm not going to go through too much, but um, in, in the arrow domain, you want to lift arbitrary functions, any function, into a computation. So, you know, this is generally a pure function, some function from you know, S to S, for example, or int to int, whatever. And it hasn't got any side effects. That's important that you don't have side effects and lots of stuff arbitrary going on. And then you can just lift that into the domain of your arrows by playing this function, which is called arrow, A double R. And if you're familiar with any kind of algebras, whether it be a monoid or whether it be a monad or whether it be applicative functors in Haskell and things, they'll all have these ways of lifting pure computations into the domain of the constructor, which is A in this case, like the computational domain that you're doing that. And for this, this A could be anything that satisfies certain laws, just as blocks has certain laws that have to be satisfied for the operations, so do arrows, and I won't talk about them here, but assuming that you can pick something, for example, DSP arrow is gonna be time to, to um, samples and things like that, that would be the way that you can construct A there. And, um, just like blocks, and this is where I originally got the idea, because as soon as I read the blocks paper, I saw the diagrams and realized, oh, actually, they're the same diagrams, pretty much. I didn't even look at the algebra initially. It was just the diagrams. Was, I mean, that's one of the lovely things I loved about blocks algebra, was that you had these diagrams straight away, which was really great. And John Hughes did exactly the same. So he has these diagrams, which show that diagrammatically, this is some input A, and it's going to some output B, applying the function F in the middle. Okay. And then, you know, you can get sequential composition. So it's the colon compos composition in um, blocks. And this takes the diagram. You know, you've got two arrow computations, so two computations, you know, one there and one there. And you can compose them together to get a new computation that goes from A to B. And you're generating a middle value inside that of C, you know, so you can compose them together. So it's exactly the same here. Hopefully, you can see that these operations intuitively are the same operations that you get in, in um, Faust. And so parallel composition is slightly more tricky. It's not explicit in the way that it is in, um, in Faust. But, and so what you need is you start to have these arrows where you've got these tuples of input and you want to apply some function to the first uh, one. So this is the left channel or the right channel. And what you don't have in, in arrows is the operations which allow you to generalize that to multiple channels so nicely, syntactically. And so that's one of the real problems that we've had. And actually, the reason I'd probably end up viewing Faustian is that the syntax for arrows is pretty horrible when you want to do DSP. I mean, it's not horrible if you want to write more sequential kind of style programs and stuff. But when you want to write in that very functional algebraic notation for DSP, Faust is actually a really nice syntax. You know, you'll give or take a few things. But you know, I'm not a huge fan of the with syntax. But, uh, ah. <laughs> but, but you know, I mean, you know, there's lots of stuff you don't like in anything, oh, isn't there, you know? Yeah. But other than that, I think syntax actually works really well. Yeah. Anyway, so, so this is, we're building up. So this allows us to play a function to the, the first channel, the left channel or, or whatever, and whilst leaving the right channel unchanged, 
Okay, and it turns out that obviously you'll want second and things like that, but once you've got first and you've got an operation called swap, then you don't, you don't actually need to define second because you can just derive it and things like that. And parallel composition itself, you know, you've got two arrows or two streams coming in, you want to apply two functions on either side or two arrow computations, then you'll just use this star 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 operation. So this is your comma operation in Faust. Okay. And it doesn't need to be a primitive operation. No, absolutely, yeah. Which in Faust, it is a primitive. Yes, in Faust. Yeah. And uh, yeah, you need that because you don't have the tuples, I presume. So. No, I just need it. Yeah, yeah, that's what I thought. But you're right, it, Hughes doesn't define it as a primitive operation. I'm not even sure Hughes actually defined it originally. I think maybe it was not until the Yale guys, but you know, John Patson or stuff, uh, picked it up when they did Yampa, which is the, um, you know, the FRP framework. I think, I can't quite remember. Yes, exactly. Yeah, which was really the same time as you were doing block when it was yeah, around and exactly. Yeah, the was uh, was uh, went several times to ICMC. Was a piano player. And yes, of course. Yeah. No, oh, yeah. So there's a quite a bit of crossover. Yes, sure. Yeah. So there is some limitations. So Hughes, in particular, he didn't define recursion. So that was the one thing. That, so John Patterson, who was doing an RA, I think, uh, postdoc at Yale University with Paul, in Paul Hudak's Haskell group. Um, wanted to do functional reactive programming and so he, he added the loop combinator and so the loop combinator is, is simply allows you to do uh, feedback and unlike Faust um, this is um, doesn't have any sample delay or anything because it, abstractly he's not thinking about signals or anything he's just it's a feedback and so of course that causes a problem when we want to do um, uh, feedback audio streams and everything and particularly we want there's no requirement for them to be causal or anything like that and stuff and things. So we need to impose that as an additional thing. And so later on, a Paul Hudak student, Yang Cheng, I think it is, in about 2007, he defined a thing called um, commutative, causal commutative arrows, which are effectively the, the arrows of Faust. They are, they're not, good because he introduced the delay. And once you instantiate A to be a, a signal, then you get the one cycle delay, because it literally takes some input B, which is zero, say, for example, for the delay operator in Faust, and he, um, at time step zero, um, or anything previous to zero, it will return B, the first argument, otherwise it will just return the feedback. So you get a delay of one cycle, which is what you need to get the signal processing feedbacks and stuff, and to guarantee the causality of the streams. Which, and it's only at this point that you do get Faust. So to be fair, even with Hughes' original definition, I don't think you could have done blocks algebra at that time. You'd have had to extend it with these things. And it took them a little while. But I think what's really, really important, and one thing that's as frustrating, I suppose I hinted that yesterday, was that what that PhD thesis from Paul's group did was he defined a normalization algorithm to guarantee that there'd only be one loop, i.e. He, he reorders all the delays and so forth and things. And it would have been really nice if we'd had one for Faust, because I could have shown that they were the same, potentially, or not. So that's why I was asking about it. So maybe one day we could write it down, if we could. It'd be really, be really good. Yeah. Sorry, can you put your microphone? Okay, sorry about that. Yeah. Yeah. So just like blocks, there are some laws that you must adhere to. And in particular, there's, some, there's not only the laws that Hughes defined, and things like making sure that... Um, you can commute arrows and things like that, and that they um, first doesn't touch the second argument and things like that, and things like that. But um, Chang Li, um, he defined these causal commutative arrows in, um, well, this is the extended paper in 2011, with his PhD, but the original paper was 2009, I think. And he adds four additional laws. And if you look at those laws, they're basically the same laws that Faust uh, maps to. And I talk about that in the paper, because we rely on that to actually do the proof that there's an equivalence, because otherwise we wouldn't get the normalization. But what I can't prove in the paper and haven't done is the normalization that we get the same term after reduction, because of course I haven't done reduction. Yeah. Okay, and so the, and the rest of it, so you can just think about when we actually want to get to DSP arrows, we can take a signal to be some Z to A, and then when we get a DSP, we can instantiate it to be an arrow from signal A to signal B. So just as you would in Faust at this point. And again, 
it's not me that did this work. This was actually the original work was done by Paul Hudak and John Peterson, who divided this notion. For, uh, he has this arrow notation as well that came out around the same time, and this uh, functional reactive programming framework called Yampa, which is um, we're still going today. They're still working on it, and. Um, for me, I think the biggest drawback with all the work that they've done, I think theoretically it's really interesting, it shows that it's the same blocks and all that sort of stuff, but their implementation is, is shoddy. You know, we can put it in another word if you like, because the performance is just, you know, they, also, they, tr they struggle to get two sign you know, oscillators you know, going together, and you know, it's just shoddy. Because, and the reason is, not because I think their framework is bad, it's because they've embedded it in Haskell, and they're doing one sample at a time, you know, it's just... It's terrible. They're just, they've got this behavior function, and it's just, there's no way they can implement it efficiently, or well, at least they haven't managed to yet. Because Haskell is compiled, so... Yeah, but it's running on a virtual machine. They, you know, it's a spineless, tagless G machine, so it's doing lazy evaluation, and they're generating everything, you know, these streams of values that are delayed, in comp you know, they're not going... And they, have to, they, they add all the strictness annotations everywhere, but still, I just think not. But what we've found is that taking, just compiling it directly, down to um, C++, we do a very similar thing to you, it's just a C++ you know, class, and then running it inside the Faust runtime. We're getting comparable. In, our compiler is not as mature as you, and so we're not as fast as you. But we're not an order of magnitude difference either. You know, certainly not for reasonable, simple examples. You know, I'm not saying that it would extend to, you know, we haven't done all the optimizations that you would have done over the last 10 years. But the point is, is that we're not a very different, when you think about it, if we lift it out, we do it in the standard, it's not that different, right? It's the same thing, it's just syntax. You know, to be honest. Okay, and so I'll just give a couple of examples and then finish, really, because th that's it, really. So you can see pretty quickly if you take something like silence. Here we're using, we, obviously, the lambda calculus is embedded into it. And if we want to do the silence, then it's just a, a, a function, a pure function that returns zero, but we lift it to the domain of arrows because then it can be sampled and, and so forth, just as you would write process equals zero in, in, in Faust, just the same thing. And um, so there it is there. And I'll give you something if I wanted to implement plus. Well, it's again just lifting it. You take a pure function where you add two numbers or two streams together and you apply, uh, well, two numbers and then you apply arrow to lift it into the DSP streams. And so, thing. so I won't at all dispute that this is much nicer <laughs> than, than this. And I, I think. Probably you could uh, hide Yeah, absolutely. No, completely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I mean, to be honest, we could adopt the Faust syntax right now. We've got the translation and just add a different type system. And that's what I was wondering might be quite an interesting thing yeah. to do, you know. And it may or may not allow us to do slightly different things because we could use a more of a qualified type system and things. And maybe we could th do things like multi-rate Faust differently or something. I don't, I don't know. But I'm just I'm speculating at this point. But it's still, I think there's some interesting areas for research, potentially. But I agree, the syntax, as Hughes defined, yeah, is pretty clunky. And you know, we can do sequential composition, that just becomes those two things composed together, and so on. Parallel composition, as I said, is the star. We don't have the underscore here for, for identity, we just use id instead, but it's the same stuff, right? And then you can do impulses and, and so on. And again, we don't have the the little exclamation, yeah, the prime, <laughs> whatever you want to call it, exclamation mark. We not exclamation mark, is it? but um, we use a delay zero. But it gives you the same thing. But notice that we have to explicitly add the values that are coming before you want to start getting the, the feedback. And, so things. and here we're just delaying it by zero. And we can do more complicated ones. But I know that got to conclude. So, um, OK. So in the paper, I provide a complete formal translation from Faust blocks into DSP arrows and prove that that is um, a sound translation, i.e. every term, well-typed term in Faust can be translated into a well-typed term with the same meaning in, um, in arrows, well, DSP arrows, not just arrows. And I don't have that in the paper another, the other way, but I have proved that now, and actually it's not that much more difficult, even though it's not difficult. I think what really would be interesting, and actually probably will be the significant result, was if we could show that the normalization algorithms are the yeah. same. Yeah, because I, I think that would actually be a, a you know, good, significant result for the community, you know, beyond just this group as well, probably in the programming language community as well. And it would be interesting to talk to the Haskell guys then as well and to show that. So I think that would be an interesting result. And that was why I was pestering for you yesterday. But anyway, yeah. there we go. Thank you. So are there any questions? Uh. 
Thanks. Interesting paper. So you mentioned multi-rate yourself. Do you think it will be easier or at least feasible to generalize the error framework for multi-rate stuff? <laughs> I don't know, to be honest. I think what I think is possible is that because we can, we can put it in a framework of the dependent type frameworks that a lot of people like Conor McBride and things have been working on right. recently, you know, and they, in, in kind of liquid Haskell or something like that. They're not in Haskell itself, but in the type framework that they've, and the people from, you know, called Nikki Mellon, I've forgotten her name now, but they've been working on. We could probably use a lot of that work to build up the dependent type system that we would need to get multi-rate Faust, rather than having the more bespoke one that you did in the other paper. That was more of my guess, but mm. so we're kind of piggybacking on some of that work, you know, and deriving and getting the theorems of three, you know, in, in quotes or whatever, to that. And that's what I was thinking. Do I think it would be any easier? Probably not, but I think it would allow us to have a formal framework that is well defined and well understood by a lot of people. Because, as far as I remember, all those functional reactive uh, frameworks suffer from severe um, efficiency issues. Right, right? But, I, but that's what I'm trying to say. And, and mm. I think some of the reviewers kept saying, oh, but you couldn't mm. put this in Haskell. But that's not what I'm saying here. What I'm saying is there is an algebra, you know, you can think of it as a categorical right. model, that, we, that has well-known type systems applied to it, particularly some of the dependent type systems that's been developed around Idris and Edgar and stuff and things, that you could take some of those ideas, just apply them to this, to arrows, you know, because it's already in that type framework, and then drive a multi-rate. And then actually maybe what we could do is just take that over because we know that it's complete. We could take it over into the Faust domain and apply it. I mean, it's quite a bit of work. It's not necessarily any easier than going up a route, but there's a lot of theorems and, and th thought that's gone into that work. And it's been or applied. maybe it could be a pre-compiler where you break it down to a single rate. Right. So that right. could be possible too. Yeah. Uh, so um, I have several questions. <laughs> the the, the first one is uh, one problem we have currently is uh, for doing physical modeling is that you need to model the fact that you have bi-directional yeah. uh, um, connections. So currently we do that by having all the communication going that way and all the feedback going okay. that way. And uh, you can generate the block diagram, but it's pretty unreadable. Yeah. So we would like to think about a new algebra that integrates that. So I'm curious to know if there are any works in the Arrow world about uh, <laughs> using bidirectional <laughs> connections or... Yes, yeah, so I think there's, but I've got to be honest, I don't know that much about it. And I've read your little paper, the Hammer Moment, you know, the block three, Faust three or whatever it is with the, with the, the vertical. And, and I think you could probably do that, but I think we'd need to check. I don't know, to be honest. Mm, mm. Yeah. Um, some of the stuff that they've done for uh, building circuits and stuff, you know, because that which would be very similar, right? Which, yeah. you know, the Mary Sheeran mm. did, which is John Hughes's wife, actually. And, and so they've got a lot of that. So that probably would ah, be the place okay. to check, oh. is my guess. But I haven't looked at that work in any detail, to be honest. And uh, another question is, how would you do variable delays in, uh, within uh, the Arrows framework? Or well, you can have any... Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, that's an interesting question. Uh, well, theoretically, uh, you can put in put parallel the all the yes, possible exactly, uh, yeah. and then have a selector at the end. Right. Mm. So I think so you have you to have a combinator that, yes. to do that. Yeah. That's true. Yeah, I hadn't thought yeah. about that. Mm. You're right. Mm. Or just stack them up together. That's yes. the only way I can think of doing it. There's no... I mean, it's a bit like the parallel thing, you know, with the tuple. It's a kind of like a bit of a... It, semantically, it works out because you can stack them all up, but you know, it looks horrible, it's not the right way. And getting an efficient implementation from that yeah, sure. requires that you have to fuse mm. them all and everything. So I agree yeah. that you probably really won't, won't want to do that in practice. You don't want to have in fast, that would work because it would be going to fuse all the delay lines. Oh, so it would, it would yes. fuse them all, would it? Mm. Yeah. During the normalization, right. yes. Yeah, so we're not doing that, I'm not doing that. Mm. At the moment. You know, I pick out some obvious ones, but I don't do anything too mm. complex. Uh, okay, it was a sign that we need. Okay, any other question? Thanks again. Thanks again. Okay. Thanks. <laughs>